chemical A0-3959X.91, also known simply as the pathogen, has shown to have devastating effects on those who are exposed to it, even in the smallest of amounts. It was first discovered on the moon of LV-233 during Project Prometheus, funded and accompanied by Peter Wayland. The dangerous properties of the substance were soon revealed. It was theorized that the beings found on LV-233, known as the Engineers, were using ampules of the chemical as a biological weapon. Prometheus crew members Fifield and Holloway were exposed to the pathogen and mutated rapidly, leading to horrific results. As seen in Alien Covenant, an entire population of Engineer-like beings was wiped out, along with much of the other life on the planet. A notable remnant, left to survive and be discovered by the crew of the Covenant, were small pods that contained spores with similar properties to the pathogen. When emitted, these spores could find a host and infect the makings of an early version of the Xenomorph XX121, known as the Neomorph. As the spore infection also rapidly takes over, the host becomes visibly and violently ill until the creature births, killing the host in the process. What emerges is a different type of form from the Xenomorph, but a deadly creature nevertheless, and an example of the frightening possibilities of this unpredictable black goo. The latest Alien novel, Alien Inferno's Fall, explores these possibilities even further. The story, written by Philippa Ballantine and Clara Charia, depicts life on the planet Shonmen, a mining colony originally designated GJ-1187. Located at the edge of the Wayland Isles, Shonmen is lush with jungle life, rivers, and a variety of indigenous creatures, many very dangerous. When a significant source of iter, a precious and valuable substance, was discovered at the planet's equator, the mining operations began. These mining operations were funded by the Union of Progressive Peoples, the UPP. Human inhabitants included the miners, waged and indentured, security personnel, and representatives protecting the corporate interests. Approximately 10 kilometers outside the gates of the mining operations, the town of New Luhansk could be found. It was financed by the Juto Combine, a rival conglomerate to Wayland yutani and at the most recent count had a population of approximately 10,000 people, as described in the novel. It started as a colony world that would provide food to the expanding population of the Wayland Isles. That changed when they found Eiter under the rock. All those colonists got pushed out in favor of merchants, shopkeepers, and anyone who thought they might make money off the mine. Most of the original pioneers shifted to the northern continent, where it was colder but more civilized. New Luhansk remained to deal with interstellar trade and provide landing space to haulers. The port became more important than those first arrivals could have imagined. The motley collection of buildings spanned a broad range from the geodomes of the abandoned colony to the rough metallic shapes of UPP facilities, bought cheap from military surplus. Nothing matched, and everything rusted in the moistness of the equatorial forest. No one much cared since they never planned on staying long. It was one of the few planets with an active eider mine, among the rarest components used in the production of hyperdrives for warships. The UPP and the United Americas had fought over the limited resources, and now this planet was a target. If someone wanted to start a war, Shonmen would not be a bad place to begin. As the driving conflict of the story is introduced, we learn that Shonmen, and specifically New Luhansk, has indeed been chosen as a target, though perhaps by an unexpected enemy. The novel describes the initial attack. A low boom rattled through the valley. A flash of light bounced overhead. A strange dark shape pushed its way through the mist, making no noise at all. The ship was a narrow horseshoe curve, with a break in the front surface, like an interrupted circle. It was more massive than any ship inside the atmosphere should be. More and more of the people on the streets, observing this strangeness, scattered to their homes. Children were snatched up, the old hastened away, and shops shut. Someone screamed for everyone to get to their basements. A spiral of pitch-black objects fell from the ship toward the center of the town. They formed a strange, elegant shape, clustering together as they twirled downward. The first screams echoed over the rooftops, and an even more terrifying sound followed. An angry buzzing rolled over New Luhansk, as if billions of stinging insects filled the air. The eerie cloud dipped down behind buildings where the last tormented screams of the initial victims oscillated and died. As the attack continues, the novel goes on to depict the violent births from the victims and the emergence of parasites that are unmistakably neomorphs. 
They grow quickly, and those who are not infected are torn apart by the ravenous creatures, and it becomes a story of survival for the miners outside of New Luhansk. The Neomorphs propagate, and an interesting development occurs. Either due to the moisture of the planet taking a similar effect on the newly born creatures as it had on the buildings, or even because of the high levels of iter from the mines, these Neomorphs begin to change. Their flesh changes from the familiar white, semi-translucent shade to a dark, rust red. Shawnman runs rampant with this new breed of Neomorph, and I don't suppose it's much of a spoiler since we do see this variant depicted on the cover of the novel. And of course we see the battles against it when Zula Hendrix and the rest of the Marines set down on the planet. What I won't be revealing though is how the pathogen affects the other non-human life on the planet. This is an area where Inferno's Fall has a lot of fun in creating Xenomorph variants in a way that we've never seen before. I've always been interested in seeing more possibilities with different types of Xenomorphs, and this novel certainly delivers on that. It's the latest book in the Alien series, Expanded Universe, and it explores the current state of war throughout this universe, set off two novels prior with Into Charybdis. The world building in this series has been really fine-tuned within the last few years, and I think the sense of structure we've been getting makes the extended stories have a more firm standing as complements to the film series. Inferno's Fall, in particular, takes so much of what we've seen in the movies, comics, other novels, and even video games, and solidifies it into the story. It weaves together the Alien series continuity with a true sense of authority and passion. There is a disadvantage to that, however. If you go into this novel without having read the previous book, Alien Colony War, or even Alien into Charybdis, it's easy to get lost. If you're not familiar with elements from the latter Dark Horse comics, like Zula Hendrix and the android Davis, then you're definitely going to feel like you're missing out on something. But the more familiar you are with the other Expanded Universe stories, the more rewarding I think Inferno's Fall becomes. It's just not something anybody at any time could pick up and get into, such as Alien the Cold Forge or Alien's Phalanx, for example. Not necessarily a bad thing, but something to consider. Personally, I've been really impressed with the rate of which we've been getting these new books and their overall quality. There's always something new to discover and to keep you excited as an Alien fan, and I can't wait for the next one. And apparently that's going to be pretty soon. Have you read Alien Inferno's Fall? What did you think? How do you feel about this overarching all-out war plotline from the most recent novels? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please comment below. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave it a like, and be sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up with the latest future videos. My very special thanks goes out to Brandon James, Grizz4756, Ronnie Jensen, and Xeno Shadowmorph, Queen Tears of the Patreon Hive. Thank you to Gregory Ford and John Griggs, the Hive's Praetorians. And a very special thanks goes out to Lady Anne in the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence, and in the role of Wailing yutani executives, Michael Cole, Nicholas Butta, and Wesley A. Weaver Jr. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.